for joining us online. And I'm excited for today because we are, as you know, in the middle of this series called Conversations with Jesus. And I love the unique perspective that we've been given throughout this series of just what exactly those red letters mean every time we open up our Bibles. Conversations with Jesus. It's been an incredible series. And you know, the thing that gets me about the conversations of Jesus is the uniqueness of them. Jesus has very unique conversations. Have you ever sat back to realize that? Unique conversations with unique people in very niche situations. It's not just the conversations he's having, it's where he's having them, who he's having them with. For starters, one of these unique conversations that we see, we know that Jesus has conversations in a ditch with a woman who's about to be stoned. We know Jesus also has a conversation in the palace, but not as a guest, as a prisoner. We also see Jesus having a conversation in the desert with the devil. We see so many different variants of conversations that Jesus has. We see Jesus communicating with people in so many different ways. We see him having conversations and preaching on mountains, on boats, and at wells. But there is one conversation in a unique location that I want to talk to you about today. There's one conversation Jesus has in a very unique, niche situation. And this conversation happens on water. As a matter of fact, we're going to jump in today in Matthew 14, 28 through 29. We're going to start here, but then we're going to rewind and we're going to see how exactly it is do we get here to begin with. Matthew 14, 28 through 29. If you're taking notes today, you can uh, take notes, or I would strongly encourage you following along with us through our Church Unlimited app. It gives you the scripture, and the notes are super easy to keep up with. So we're going to jump in Matthew 14, 28 through 29, starting here. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. This verse paints a picture to us of what it means when God allows you to be an exception. See, all throughout scripture, we see people walking from point A to point B. We see Jesus walking from point A to point B. We know that Jesus' animal of choice that he mounts is a donkey, a walking animal. We see Moses walking from point A to point B. We see the same thing with David. We see walking all throughout the Bible. And we know that people walk on land. But in this one situation, and in this one conversation, we see where Jesus allows a man to be an exception. We see where Jesus allows somebody to walk where they shouldn't be walking, to step where they shouldn't step, to do something no one else has done before. And we see him allow Peter to walk on water. We see Jesus allow somebody to be a water walker, a water walker. Church Unlimited, I want to talk to you from this subject today, how to be a water walker. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, I'm a water walker. A water walker, a water walker, an exception, a water walker. See, a water walker, the nickname water walker alone is already encouraging to me. Why is it encouraging to me? Well, because if I'm a water walker, that means I get to walk on what other people drown in. If I'm a water walker, I get to step on things that would consume normal, everyday people. But with Jesus, when you're a water walker, you see things and say, I'm good, I'm walking on it. When you're a water walker, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of financial stress in my life, but I'm walking on it. Yeah, Yeah, the holiday season's coming up, and there's going to be some family drama, but I'm walking on it. (laughs) Yeah, there's been a little bit of struggles with my mental health lately, some ups and some downs, but I'm walking on it. Because with Jesus, he allows you to walk on what other people drown in. A water walker. This verse paints a perfect picture 
for me and for you of what it means for with Jesus to do things nobody else can do, to allow you to be a water walker. So we're in this series, Conversations with Jesus. I would have to ask Jesus, if I was sitting across from him face to face, I would have to ask him, Jesus, how do I be a water walker? Like I said, we're going to take some notes today, something for us to reflect and expand on. If you're taking notes, the first thing I would have you write down is this. If you want to be a water walker, number one, immediately set boundaries to allow time for self-care and spiritual disciplines. Immediately set boundaries to allow time for self-care and spiritual disciplines. So like I said, the verse we just read is where we were picking up. But now we're going to rewind and we're going to see how did we get here. You'll notice the first word of the verse I'm about to read is immediately. And there's a reason for that. Matthew 14, 22 through 24 says this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Immediately. First word there is immediately. It begs the question, immediately after what? The cool thing about the miracle we're about to see and the conversation we're about to see unfold on water is just before that was actually when Jesus performed the miracle of multiplying the fish and the bread. And whenever he's finished with that miracle, he sends the disciples off immediately, and he shows us something powerful here. He himself, Jesus himself says, you go on ahead, I'm gonna go get away and pray. You go on ahead, but I'm gonna get some alone time with my heavenly father. The interesting thing is the perspective of the disciples. Now, I'm no genius, but I do know if I'm a disciple, I want Jesus in my boat. Because I know if Jesus is in my boat, nothing's going to go wrong. It's like a sense of insurance if Jesus is in my boat. And I'm sure the disciples had preferences, and I'm sure they preferred Jesus to be in their boat. But Jesus understands something so powerful. Jesus recognizes the difference between accommodating preferences and meeting needs. Jesus says, I know you would prefer me to be with you all the time, but there's a better version of me that I can only access whenever I get alone and spend time with my father. I understand you want me to be there and you want me to be in your boat, but I just need to get alone and set a boundary here. That way I can get away and get time with my father. You don't want me when I've been robbed of my time with my father. You don't want the me that hasn't gotten away to pray, to be spiritually disciplined. You don't want that version of me. He understands there's a better version of me whenever I get away to pray. Jesus himself understands the value that comes with spiritual disciplines. So watch this. He sends them ahead. He sends them ahead, and we know that they have a considerable head start by the time Jesus wraps up praying and begins to meet them out on the water. So they have a head start. They've already been rowing all night, hours head start. And Jesus not only meets them there, he beats them there. So let me get this straight. While they're rowing, Jesus was praying. While they're straining Jesus was praying. While they're struggling and stressing and trying to do everything in their power to get from point A to point B, Jesus was praying. And because Jesus was praying, where they had to row to, Jesus got to walk to. Where they had to stress to, Jesus simply got to stride to, stride to. You see, prayer gives you a sense of supernatural stamina. Prayer gives you a sense of taking you further, faster. And many times we think that we can just go from point A to point B. But there is something that takes place whenever you get alone and set a boundary to allow time for prayer and spiritual disciplines. What takes place is a quantum leap that you would not get without the Father. Whenever you set time away 
to partake in your spiritual disciplines, self-care, and prayer, you can go further, faster. He not, only meet, he not only would meet them there, he beat them there. And unfortunately, we've been sold this lie of convenience, that it's convenient to not partake in spiritual disciplines. It's convenient to just go to church once a week. And we tell ourselves things like, I don't have time to get in the word every day. I don't have time to pray every day. I don't have time to set aside just one day in my week to go be in a life group. And I certainly don't have time to stay one service after and not just sit, to not just sit in service, but to also serve a service. And we fed into this lie that spiritual disciplines somehow slow us down. But no, 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 friend. Spiritual disciplines were never meant to slow you down. Spiritual disciplines have been in place to speed you up. Because there's a supernatural stamina you get when you allow time for prayer and spiritual discipline. You go further, faster, whenever you make time. So he sends them off. And he doesn't just meet them there. Jesus somehow beats them there. Because when you're a water walker, what other people have to row to and struggle to, you just get to walk to. He doesn't just meet them there. He beats them there. Now watch this. Not only that, we're we're picking up Matthew 14, 25 through 26 now. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. They said. And they cried out in fear. So watch this. Not only do they not recognize Jesus, they don't just uh, not recognize Jesus, they also mislabel him. So they don't recognize Jesus, they don't recognize God in the flesh. Let me ask you something. How is it that you can be with someone, learn from someone, walk with someone, eat with someone, be mentored by someone for three years and still not know what they look like. Maybe it's because God doesn't always look like God in a storm. Sometimes it's because God doesn't always look like God in a storm. And they see Jesus, think that it's a storm. And not only do they not recognize him, they mislabel him, say, oh, it's a ghost. And we at times, if we're being honest, can be too quick to label some things bad that are good. And we will identify something as a storm. No, 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 that's not a storm. That's actually of God. It may have taken a storm to get you to realize it was God all along, but no, 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 that's not a storm. That's actually of God. That's not a breakup. That's a breakthrough. That's not a layoff or a closed door. That's a new door that's about to swing open on that old hinge. And not all things that or look like storms, are storms. Sometimes God just doesn't look like God in a storm. So they don't only not recognize him, they also go one further and mislabel him. Because God doesn't always look like God in a storm. We pick up in Matthew 14, 25 through 26. 28 through 29, sorry. Lord, this is Peter now. If it's you, Peter replied, tell me, to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Peter's ready to have a conversation. All the other, disciple, all the other disciples are more concerned with it being a storm or are thinking that well, whoever's standing out there is a ghost. But Peter decides to be different. And we see this conversation that Peter has with Jesus. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus' response, come, one more time. Lord, If it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Detail. Peter is asking a question that is very specific and very detailed. But Jesus' response is not with detail. Jesus' response is actually a one-word answer. Because sometimes we are not going to get the full blueprint. Sometimes you're not going to get all the answers. And the question is, is one word from Jesus enough? 
Is one word from Jesus enough for me to step out of the boat? And what's scary to think is some people never go because they've determined one word from Jesus still isn't enough. Is one word from your Savior enough? Is one word from God enough? Detail. Jesus doesn't respond with detail. He doesn't give him the grand plan or a blueprint or every single answer. He doesn't give him the Ikea instructions. He gives him one word. Come. Is one word from God enough? Many of us have been putting off a word from God for so long, and we wonder why we can't hear him still. He's been communicating to you, but you're ignoring the one thing he's trying to drive home. Is one word from God enough? Is that one word he gave you a long time ago to finally join a life group enough? Is that one word he gave you to stop just attending, but finally start serving in God's house enough? Is one word from God enough? Or have we convinced ourselves that one word still isn't enough? Is one word from God enough? Is a word from Jesus enough for us to be willing to step out of the boat? Because Jesus isn't always going to give you all the details. Are you willing to step out of the boat on a come? Before we close today, there's this question I want to ask you. And this question has changed how I read this passage completely. The question I want to ask you today is this. Are we stepping out to show off or are we stepping out to get close? Are we stepping out to show off or are we stepping out to get close? You know, one thing that we have to remember as the Bi- uh, about the Bible whenever we read it is no word falls void. Every word has meaning. And so if every word has meaning, that also means the order they are in has meaning. So I want you to look at something. Verse 28. What Peter says to Jesus. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Look at the order that Peter makes his request. Peter makes his request and he's prioritizing one thing before the other. He doesn't say, Lord, if it's you, tell me to get on the water and then come to you. He says, Lord, if it's you, just tell me to come to you on the water. Peter's primary objective is not to do the incredible. Peter is not obsessed with trying to do what no man hasn't done before. Peter isn't trying to get some sort of status above the other disciples. Peter's primary concern is to simply get close to Jesus. He's not concerned about the status. He's not concerned about trying to be a water walker. He's more concerned with one thing. Lord, if it's you, just tell me to get close to you. This verse hits home with me every time I read it. Because if I'm being honest, I have, I've grown up in this church. This church is all I know. So I got a lot of investment here. And many times we, we all do this. We mean well when you're really, really invested. But sometimes you get the order wrong. And sometimes I can't help but find myself wanting things to be a certain way. I want worship to be as excellent as it can be. I want the light show to be the best that it can be. I want to make sure that we are presenting the best way possible. But sometimes you have to ask yourself the the question, am I stepping out to show off or are we stepping out to get close? At the end of the day, it should always be, the primary objective should always be simply just getting close to Jesus, not doing the miraculous, not doing what's impressive not doing what no one else has done before. It's not about status. It's about getting close to Jesus. It's not about walking on water. And what's crazy is we remember this story as Peter walking on water. But what if this was the story where Peter would do anything to get close to Jesus, even if it meant drowning? It's not about walking on water. It's always been about getting close to Jesus. 
And what's scary to think about is for many of us, we started our spiritual journey and we started our walk with Jesus. Something like this, God, I'm just gonna cling to you. I'm not concerned about anything else in my life. I'm not concerned about any of these other things. I'm just gonna cling to you. I'm gonna cling to you, I'm gonna cling to you. And if these things happen to unfold, that's great. But my primary concern is just getting close to you. And now we find ourselves a couple years later pursuing walking on water more than pursuing him. Now we see ourselves years later pursuing the dream more than the one who put the dream in us. It's not about walking on water. It's always actually supposed to come back to one main thing, simply getting close to him. If I can just help all the guys in the room right now, all the men, look, we all wanna walk on water. Every man wants to do the impressive. We can't help it. Every man wants to do what hasn't been done before. All of us want to achieve things and, and we want to walk on water and do the impressive. But can I help you right now? Your family isn't looking for a water walker. Your family's looking for a man who's simply just trying to get close to Jesus. Your daughter needs a daddy who is teaching her what it means to just get close to Jesus. Your son needs to know what it means to be a man that is willing to drop everything and to not worry about walking on water, but to just prioritize getting close to Jesus. Your wives don't care that much if you walk on water. They would rather see a man who is prioritizing just getting close to Jesus. It's not about walking on water. It's not about doing the incredible or the miraculous or the impressive. It's always been about getting close to Jesus. But you know the cool thing about Jesus? When you pursue him and you just wanna get close to him, that's when he lets you walk on water. Church Unlimited, will you pray with me? Father God, we pray right now in this moment. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to become water walkers. God, one word from you is more than enough for us to step out of our boat of comfort. One word from you is more than enough to just prioritize getting close to you. Lord, it's never been about walking on water. It's never been about trying to do the impressive. It really comes back to one main thing and that is simply getting closer to you. I pray God that we no longer put off that one word you've been given us. I pray that today we start implementing boundaries and recognizing that spiritual discipline was never meant to slow us down. It was always put in place to supernaturally speed us up. God, let this be a day where we no longer put off what you've been putting on our hearts, Lord. Let this be a day where we truly become a water walker and water walkers ultimately pursue you. Maybe you're in the room today and you've been putting off a relationship with Jesus. I got news for you, it's really hard to get close to Jesus whenever you don't have a relationship with him. It's really hard to get close to somebody that you don't have a relationship at all. And you know what blows my mind is there is nothing holding us back from getting close to Jesus. You can get as close to Jesus as you want. There's no crowds in the way. There's no threat of Romans arresting him and taking him away from us. No, no, no. There's nothing stopping us from getting close to Jesus. As a matter of fact, the people that stop us from getting close to Jesus happen to be ourselves. And maybe you want to start a relationship with him today. And if that's you, you can do so right now. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can prioritize just getting close to him. And then it's amazing what you can do whenever your first primary goal is just getting close to him. If you wanna accept him right now as your Lord and Savior, you can do so by praying this prayer with me in church. We're all gonna pray this prayer out loud to encourage someone who may be shy today. If that's you, just pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I admit I'm a sinner. And I believe you came and died for me and rose again three days later, proving that you were God. 
Jesus, I repent of my sins. I put you in first place. Jesus, I make you my Lord. Jesus, I make you my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Right now, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, and you made that decision, a decision to finally step out of the boat and just get close to him, I just want you to do one thing for me. No one's looking around right now. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, be brave. He was brave for you. Two, own it. Three, raise that hand if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Hold that hand high. Own it. Own that salvation the way Jesus owned all of our sin. Hold that hand high. Nobody's looking around right now. This is just a moment for you. Incredible. Hold that hand high. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, thank you so much for what you've done today. Thank you so much for our new brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you that we get to have real, intimate, one-on-one conversations and relationship with you. Thank you that you are not a distant God. Thank you that you are God who comes down and lives the everyday, day-to-day, real life with us. Thank you so much for what you've done and thank you for everything you're going to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.